And now we will have the first talk of the afternoon uh, by my good friend uh, Federico Pizzotta. Uh, he is subbing in and he's going to be talking. He is, he is the curator of the museum in Milan. He's also established a, a world-class uh, facility for taking care of, of the improving minerals through cleaning, through trimming, through other kinds of things, but doing it in a way that professional scientists would appreciate not only in the benefactors of having a rock or a mineral specimen that is improved. Uh, Federico is well known. He's also uh, had a mineral named after him, but it's, it's strange that he is really fairly well known mostly for pegmatite minerals, and the talk uh, that he's subbing, substituting for is anything but pegmatitic in nature. Um, so uh, talk about sulfur. Federico? Thank you, Jane. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Sulfur's a good rock. Yeah, I will try to do my best. So, I believe that uh, everybody knows that I am here uh, taking care about the presentation of uh, Renato Pagano. Renato Pagano is, uh, since a long time, a good friend. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor for me to be here doing this job. I'm happy to, to be able to help him. And uh, so, but we made a contract because uh, when I was uh, visiting him a few days ago, taking care about the last details of the presentation, he told me that if the end of the presentation, the public will uh, throw me tomatoes and uh, garbage, <laughs> <laughs> he would be the owner of that. So <laughs> I will try to do my best in any case. So now, Renato is here. He's uh, since a very long time a mineral collector. I believe that everybody here knows him. And uh, he is from Catania. He born in Sicily. And uh, this is the origin of his love for uh, Sicilian minerals. But uh, he performed his schools. Uh, and he became an engineer in Genova. And after he went on uh, studying, uh, getting a PhD or high degree school in uh, New York at the Rice University. And after he returned back to Italy and uh, he, in his career, he became uh, a manager in one of the most important Italian public industries. And, uh, but he never forgot Sicily and uh, he got a huge culture about uh, the mines, the history and so on. So, this uh, presentation actually is a small, uh, uh, is a drop of his knowledge about this topic, but uh, I will try to see what we can do in 40 minutes. So Sicily is uh, located at the center of the Mediterranean Sea, and, uh, oh, sorry, I tried to work with the pointer. Okay, it worked. And uh, it is located here. This is uh, the Italian peninsula. This is France, Spain, uh, Greece. And uh, Sicily is here. You can see it is very close to Africa. And uh, the Sic uh, Sicily has a typical triangular shape. It's an island. And it is dominated in the morphology by this huge structure. This huge structure is uh, 1,100 square kilometers in size. And it is the Etna volcano. And uh, Sicily is known for the volcanic activity. On the eastern side, there is Etna and the Aeolian there. But uh, as you can see, this is uh, the tip of the Etna. Etna is a stratovolcano, very similar to the Hawaiian one. And it is uh, dominating uh, the Catania town the place where Renato born, and this is the sea, so you see that uh, it seems that uh, it is not uh, such a safe place, but uh, people is used to live there since uh, 2,000 years. And uh, the Aeolian island, actually, even worse, this is the Stromboli island, and I have a look to the village here. They believe that this is a safe place. And uh, if, you, if you look at the, at the volcano, it, if you look at uh, Volcano Island, uh, if you look at the Google Earth image, it is even worse because this is the crater, and inside the crater is the village, so who knows what to do. <laughs> In any case, why 
Renato wanted to show the volcanoes first because many people are convinced that, that uh, sulfur and volcanoes are related in Sicily. Indeed, uh, this is wrong. The Sicilian sulfur deposits are in the sedimentary terrains, uh, which compose about two thirds of the area of the island and uh, they have nothing to do with the volcanic activity. And uh, uh, yes, sulfur is also present along a similar formation along, uh, all along uh, Italy and uh, there are no volcanoes there. So it's a uh, uh, no relationship between volcanoes and sulfur deposit there. And uh, indeed, uh, the sulfur is occurring in the upper Miocene argillaceous limestones, which are in general associated with huge volumes of uh, gypsum. And uh, the sulfur is coarse crystalline. In general, it occurs in two or three major units inside uh, the Argillaceous formation. And uh, sometimes the veins uh, are up to 30 meters thick, so they are huge veins. Uh, and what is the origin of the sulfur? Uh, there is a, obviously as soon as the sulfur mines are very old mines, there, is a, uh, there were in the past many different interpretation about the origin. What is uh, sure is that uh, all the sulfur in these units is uh, of evaporitic origin. What what are evaporitic rocks? So this is a, a major geological event. What is called the salinity crisis of the Mediterranean Sea. This is a process which uh, the geologist discovered studying the sedimentary units uh, surrounding the, the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, this part of the study was promoted trying to explain the origin of the sulfur deposits. Uh, actually, what happened is that uh, the Gibraltar Strait in the Miocene 5.96, uh, 960,000 years ago, 5 million, close to 6 million years ago, closed because of the pushing of the tonic plate of Africa against uh, Europe. And uh, this uh, created the evaporation of the Mediterranean Sea. But if you think what means the evaporation of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, these are something like 2.5 uh, millions 2.5 million square kilometers of water, which seawater, which evaporated. And this happened over a period which was estimated in maybe a few thousand years. The climate was uh, enough dry to not, uh, um, as, and the evaporation of the sea was uh, not compensated by the water coming from the rivers from the Europe. This produced an increase in the salinity and uh, a, a deep increase in the salinity and the precipitation of uh, the less, so, less soluble salts before and the more soluble salts at the end in a cyclic process which uh, led to the formation of uh, huge evaporitic units composed by gypsum, mostly by carbonates, gypsum, and halite. And if you, build, if you think that these are 2.5 million square kilometers, you can see that these units are enormous. And uh, the depression created by the evaporation of the water was uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 meters below the level of the ocean. This process, this process went on uh, for over half a million years up to when uh, around uh, 5 million 330,000 years ago, 
the Gibraltar Strait reopen. Reopening this strait, the ocean invaded in a catastrophic event the Mediterranean Sea, and you have uh, to think at hundreds of thousands of uh, cubic kilometers of ocean water invading this basin, and it was estimated, that some theories say that in a few months, the complete basin was filled with an increase in the level of the water of about 10, 15 meters each day. So this destroyed completely the life, the forest, everything, and it buried below sediments and water all these evaporitic units, which are now present below the floor of the Mediterranean Sea. If you can believe, this was the beginning of the story of the formation of our sulfur. If this was not happening, no sulfur in Sicily. The same processes which closed the Gibraltar Strait actually were responsible of, uh, in the next time, the next millions of years, of the building of the Italian peninsula. Microplates tectonic moving created the Apennine chains, and part of the evaporitic rocks were actually brought in the, uh, in the mountain chain, disrupted in fragments, and uh, actually the not continuity and the deformation of this formation produced many troubles to the mining activity because many times there were overestimation of the potential of the deposits because the deposits were interrupted by fault deformation and so on. And uh, yeah, and in this process, actually, I can say that the rocks were cooked by the constitution of the mountain belt. Actually, some temperature was there, the formation, temperature, fluid circulation. And the part of the gypsum actually was uh, decomposed uh, through a reduction process, uh, creating uh, on one side carbonates and on the other side sulfur. And this process was associated with the formation of uh, some significant oil deposits. Indeed, the oil is present in several areas all around Italy. And uh, hydrocarbons are common uh, together with the sulfur. And all these processes produce recrystallization, formation of cavities, lateral movements. And this is actually all the processes which, uh, which, are, uh, which produce the crystals we know today. And uh, if you look at Italy, we can see that the formation of the, uh, this, uh, this um, evaporitic rocks are distributed all along the island, uh, but the major deposits are here in Italy, and, uh, and some significant are here in uh, Romania. And uh, on a uh, um, mining point of view, in any case, uh, Sicily was the most important uh, Place as, for example, in 1908, uh, produced 2.6 million metric tons of sulfur, while the three districts, the other three districts in which there are mines, sulfur mines in Italy, produce altogether 214,000 metric tons, uh, which means that uh, all the other districts together are not even the 8% of the total of the production. So, in any case, Sicily is also the place of production of the best mineral specimen, except for two important mines in Emilia, Romagna, and Marche, which had a very small production, but uh, with very high quality of the crystals. And now, if we go to, to Sicily, uh, 
this is an old map in 18, made in 1897 of the distribution of uh, the sulfur deposits. And if you think that this is Etna and it is 1,100 square kilometers, you can see that there are several thousand square kilometers of outcrop of uh, gypsum and sulfur and associated minerals. And I remember when I was a kid, my parents brought me to make uh, some holidays in uh, Sicily, and I was traveling with the car. I was 10 years old in the half 70s from Catania to Palermo here. And we were passing through roads, uh, cutting kilometers and kilometers and kilometers of gypsum crystals. When I my father was driving, I cannot believe it, I said this is a paradise of crystals. <laughs> yeah. And till now, if you make this road, this road are cut for kilometers across gypsum crystals. And obviously, being Sicily, very close in the, of the area in which uh, the culture, the ancient culture developed, and it was populated by Greeks and Romans and so on, the sulfur was not overlooked by the ancient people, but they were using uh, just uh, for some medical uh, treatments, so there was no real extraction up to the later, 18th century, when sulfur became an important ingredient in gunpowder. At this point, uh, the, the, a significant uh, uh, mining started, and uh, up, to, up to the Industrial Revolution, which occurred uh, shortly later, and uh, in this moment, uh, the use of sulfur became very important, and uh, a massive extraction of sulfur from uh, Sicily started, but uh, the problem was that uh, uh, as soon as uh, there was a lot of mining, uh, it happened that uh, uh, the claims were di disrupted in hundreds of uh, small owners, and this was not helping an industrial production. So there were some British entrepreneurs which started acquiring and operating several claims together uh, in 1830. Uh, uh, this started some conflicts with France and the king of the two Sicilies, and so it, the war for the monopoly of this mine started. And uh, the method used at the time uh, was very primitive, actually. They started in the early time with trenches and uh, small pits, and after started with tunneling with uh, uh, inclined, inclined planes up to 150, 250 meters. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the use uh, of hoisting and pumping equipments uh, for a, a more modern extraction of sulfur actually was uh, started in the latest time of the activity and they, it ended up uh, very soon. Uh, in any case, this uh, activity, quite primitive activity of extraction, was a saving specimen. The mining method, I, I, you can see this photo, you can understand what was going on. Uh, actually, the, the miners were digging holes inside the, uh, the vein, leaving pillars, and uh, uh, the miners were divided into groups. The picconieri, which uh, were the workers using a pickaxe breaking the rocks, and uh, the carusi. The picconieri were uh, loading bags uh, which were over 50 or over 50 kilos, and the carusi were boys which were carrying out from the mines this, uh, this weight. And this was going on all the days, all the days, all the days. And, uh, okay, and the social situation. The social, si social situation is, was a disaster, obviously, because uh, the Carusi were the slaves of the picconieri, and uh, there were tensions, and there were problems, and uh, uh, the situation was, uh, was very bad. And uh, you have to imagine that the temperature in the mine was very high, <laughs> The smell of sulfur and uh, the gases was unbelievable. And the people working there, the miners, were working mostly naked. 
because in this condition, this wa it was the only way of uh, taking, uh, of being able to work. So I don't believe this was so far from the hell. <laughs> so the market. The market obviously was uh, depending on the demand. So as I told you, most of the work was done during the 19th century because at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there was uh, the development uh, of uh, the so-called uh, Frasch process, uh, which uh, was uh, patented in 1901 uh, uh, in the United States, in Louisiana, which was a system in which uh, it was possible to pump uh, superheated steam down at the top of salt domes, which, were, which uh, are occurring in Louisiana in a quantity, uh, leaching out, uh, dissolving actually the sulfur because the sulfur temperature, melting temperature is uh, something like 112 degrees, uh, and bringing up the sulfur in this way. This was uh, this process was able to produce in United States sulfur at half a price it was possible to produce in Sicily. So I can really say that from the beginning of the 20th century, the work in, uh, uh, in Sicily for the sulfur mine was carried out uh, uh, losing money. And this was uh, some kind of activity, uh, at least in part supported by the government for uh, keeping care about uh, the social and the economic uh, situation. So indeed, uh, the number of the mines between uh, 1919 uh, uh, and uh, 1940 uh, went down from 800 to 100, and uh, from 40,000 people working up to a few thousand. And after the Second World War, the situation was even worse, and the, there was a decline, a decline of the production up to the closure of the mines uh, at the end of the 70s, so quite all the mines. Some mines went on uh, up to half of the 80s. And let's see some, uh, some mines and some uh, famous names. The Chanchana Mine. Chanchana is one of the uh, most important names. Probably this was the most important mine for producing uh, mineral specimen. From Chanchana, we have uh, a lot of varieties of uh, super nice crystals. And uh, the, uh, the other positive thing is that in Chanchana, sulfur can be associated with nice aragonite twin crystals, which are uh, white or glassy and so on, in a sometimes spectacular specimen. And, uh, and uh, gypsum. Gypsum can occur in fantastic uh, gem quality crystals from there. And Kotsudizi, Kotsudizi is the second important mine. Kotsudizi became very popular uh, more recently than Chanchana because uh, I suppose that uh, during the last period uh, when the government was supporting the mine and the miners were doing nothing, I believe that they just collected a specimen. This happened in the, uh, from half of the 70s up uh, to the beginning of the 80s uh, when uh, the market of specimen uh, was starting uh, becoming popular and uh, the miners started collecting. And from Kotsudizi, there are the, uh, the typical uh, um, crystals uh, rich in hydrocarbons. Floristella is another important mine. Uh, now there is a mining park at the place, uh, and it was very important for the production of um, celestite crystals, the long, the elongated, uh, sometimes colorless crystal with sulfur inclusion. So, or without sulfur inclusion from Floristella. Giumentaro Capodarso, another important minor, uh, another important thing is that the aragonite from these localities has an unbelievable fluorescence in uh, pink. And uh, some of the best fluorescent crystals of aragonite are coming from this mine. La Grasta is famous for many nice specimens, but mostly this kind of uh, pillow of uh, uh, pale blue, la quite large crystals, quite large and lustrous crystals of celestite, more or less associated with sulfur. Radusa, I believe that this is a name many people know for uh, the um, uh, Howerite crystal, which are 
which were found in a limestone lens in between the sulfur lenses. And this is what remains now of this mine. And the Caltanissetta mining district uh, with several uh, mines, Giumentaro, Gesso Lungo, La Grasta, Testa Secca, Trabonella, Mucurufa, and many other mines are uh, the mines that sometimes you find reported on the old labels of uh, the specimen. And uh, okay, let's say something about uh, the ore treatment of sulfur. Uh, the first method of extracting sulfur was uh, very um, primitive. Uh, as soon as sulfur is melting at uh, 112 degrees, uh, the miners were used to made uh, some kind of uh, pile covered with earth, put fire, use uh, the heat of the burning sulfur to melt the other sulfur with a recovery of about 30% of, uh, of product, which means that 70% was, uh, was destroyed, and not a very good way of uh, preserving uh, the ore. And uh, this was the so-called Calcarelle method, okay. And, uh, and later, there was the Gill Kilns method, uh, which was actually a series, composed by a series of chambers, so this, the first one was heated, and the steam was coming out there, preheating this chamber and so on and so on in a complicated way. This was able to recover something like 70% of the ore, which was much better. But the worst problem was not the quantity of uh, sulfur miners were able to recover, but it was uh, the volume of the smoke this, that uh, these uh, uh, plants were producing because the smoke rich in sulfur was distributing all around in the hills uh, and there was a continuous war between uh, people which were cultivating and people which were mining uh, and the part of these areas in which these uh, plants were operating were completely transformed into desert. Okay, the final product actually were ingots that were charged on, uh, uh, on sheath to be transported and the ingots were something like 50 to 80 kilos in weight, in weight each one. And let's go to the minerals. Yeah, the minerals actually you know that the most important minerals are aragonite, sulfur and selenite. But after this mineral, uh, recent, uh, recent uh, uh, my min mm, mineral collector found uh, something else. In any case, uh, Sicily actually is, uh, uh, is well known mostly for these three minerals. And uh, we start from gypsum, and this is the gypsum everybody would like to see from Sicily with uh, nice crystals, super lustrous, gemmy, and uh, with uh, sulfur inclusions. And uh, these uh, kind of crystals are in general from Chanchana. Uh, and obviously, sulf uh, uh, gypsum crystals are, uh, gypsum crystals are uh, super soft and delicate, and so very, uh, a very limited number of high quality specimens survived. But they are not only these crystals, they are also other qualities which are more common worldwide from other mines. In any case, the best material is always from uh, Chanchana for concerning gypsum. Another gypsum, Aragonite. Aragonite is uh, typically uh, composed by multiple uh, twin crystals and uh, pseudo-hexagonal, and this was well known uh, since uh, the first uh, steps of uh, the mineralogical researches, and it was documented in many historic uh, publications. And uh, you can see very well here uh, the surface, the termination of one of these pseudo-hexagonal crystals, which is composed by three twinned uh, uh, penetrated uh, prismatic crystals. And uh, you can see that sometimes aragonite can be very glassy and uh, sometimes uh, is uh, partially transformed into calcite. This is a big piece. It is uh, over 40 centimeters across, uh, again, from uh, Chanchana. I will speak again later about uh, this piece. Uh, this piece was actually traded uh, to the Milano Museum several years ago by Renato Pagano, so we have in our collection now. 
and uh, this is another typical example, always from Chanchana. This is another variety, more glassy, more sharp, and this is uh, still from uh, Chanchana. And uh, again, glassy, glassy crystal with sulfur crystals, again from Chanchana. Calcite, I mentioned calcite just because it is a, a common replacement of aragon aragonite, and it is composing frequently the matrix of the sulfur crystals. And the celestite, celestine, celestine, celestine uh, is uh, a very important mineral, and uh, also in, uh, in the past, in, uh, during the 18th century, uh, many different more crystal morphologies were documented. And uh, this is a typical Floristella piece, and this is another Floristella crystal. And this another morphology of uh, celestite from uh, Floristella. And this is a very unusual piece from uh, the Grotta Calda mine. This is a large piece for over 40 centimeters belonging to the Corrado Ferrito col uh, collection in Sicily. Sorry. Uh, this is uh, from La Grasta mine, and it is another celestite variety. La Grasta was famous for this uh, uh, pale blue sharp uh, celestite crystal associated with sulfur. And uh, okay, we, spoke, we told before about howerite. Howerite, uh, everybody knows, is a, a manganese sulfate. And uh, it forms very nice uh, crystals, uh, which are typical uh, from the Districella mine. But everything you see around was found uh, in a single discovery in, at the end of the 19th century. So every crystal you find in historic collection belong to this discovery, nothing before and quite nothing after. And they are nice crystal with different morphologies. Melanophlogite, I mentioned melanoph melanophlogite just because uh, uh, it was described for the first time in Sicily, and so uh, um, the Jonah mine uh, is, uh, is the type locality in 1876. Uh, there are tiny crystals like this. I show you another morphology, and uh, there are tiny group of crystals here of melanophlogite with uh, celestite, and uh, you have here several uh, crystal forms of uh, this rare mineral, not rare mineral, but a quite unusual mineral. And uh, okay, I just mentioned quartz and opal, which was overlooked in the past. You would never find in a publication mention quartz and opal from this mine, but it is quite common, just overlooked. And uh, quartz sometimes is covering also sulfur, which is quite unusual because of the temperature contrast you can expect, but quartz actually can form at very low temperature. Too. And the strontianite was also found quite recently in nice uh, sprays up to two centimeters together with the uh, celestite and barite. But uh, okay, uh, Renato here, he wanted to point out that there are two generations of collectors. The new generation with uh, people uh, taking care about uh, the damp material, the remaining outcrops, or buying stuff around in the market, trying uh, to, to create uh, collections of Sicilian minerals in Sicily. And uh, the oldest tie collector, Renato Pagano, in the 60s, with his motorbike, uh, I promised you I would speak again with, about this aragonite. The large aragonite now in the museum was in this wooden box. So <laughs> we see again the same piece. Renato was going around with his motorbike in the 60s, buying uh, specimen in the various uh, from, uh, from the miners and so on. And OK, so uh, I, I have not to, to, to speak tell so much about uh, sulfur, about properties and so on, but crystal forms, uh, there is a huge variety, including uh, some very rare twin. And uh, this is a variety of uh, specimen of sulfur, and uh, the most important mine we told before is uh, Kotsudisi and, uh, and um, Chanchana, where, Kotsudisi and Chanchana, from where they are the most classic and important specimen. This is another crystal, another group of crystals, nice cluster. And sulfur can have also a reddish color, can have uh, tabular crystals, and uh, bisphenoidal crystals, which are very rare. And again, a red variety from, uh, from Chanchana, steep crystals. And uh, okay, as, as 
every classic locality. There are long stories behind many pieces. I just want to mention this uh, famous piece, which was <coughs> actually in the Clarence Behrman collection in 1880, and it was purchased by J.P. Morgan in 1910, donated to the American Museum after it was traded out from the American Museum in 1971 to dealers, and after Joe Budd took this photo when uh, the piece was in the hands of uh, our friend Rob. And some artwork, obviously, Sulfur can, was represented uh, also in, uh, by some painter. And uh, specimen recovery, what I can tell you, there were huge pockets from where the miners were collecting. And uh, some of the pockets, uh, I, I spoke with some old miners, they reported me that some pockets are still in place, that they are tens and tens of meter, meters wide. Actually, the best material in general was not in these giant cavities, it was in a more limited cavity. And uh, I, I am not lying when I say that there are documented cavities containing gypsum crystal which are not so far from the famous Nika one. With uh, cavities of 50, 60, somebody speaking about cavities over 100 meters or 200 meters across, they call the Zubia. Is a famous, uh, famous place which actually was quite never explored properly because of the presence of the gases, hydrocarbons, gases, and so on. And uh, the market, obviously, there was a very old market. The market was starting uh, at the origin uh, through many international dealers. Uh, we can uh, mention Ward, George English, Foot, uh, and uh, there were also some European dealers. and. Uh, here is uh, a food catalog uh, reporting some experience he had uh, visiting the mines in Sicily and giving prices uh, of the specimen. And uh, some stuff remain also in the Italian Museum, and I just want to show you some huge pieces we have in the Milano collection. This is uh, over 40 centimeters across. This is from Cozzodisi, and the crystals are around four centimeters across, very gemmy lustres with hydrocarbons on the matrix. And this is an enormous crystal, over 20 by 20 centimeters uh, in size, uh, and it is uh, from a Chanchana mine, a famous piece of the I mean, you can see my hand here. And okay, so Renato at this point, everybody is excited about sulfur, want to kill everybody with this chapter, fakes. <laughs> this happened in, 19, no, in 2002 when he published for the first time on the mineralogical record a famous article describing what happened when uh, this gentleman Sergio Martinat decided in 1975, he discovered a way for cre of creating fakes, uh, sulfur fakes, and he polluted the market with this material. Nobody was speaking for quite a long time about uh, this material, but uh, Renato in 2002, he took uh, all the documentation, he met the man, and he disclosed completely the situation. People were shocked, and this, I believe, destroyed the market of sulfur specimen for several years, up to when people became more confident. Why they became more confident? The next year, 2003, uh, there was um, uh, a paper, I believe, published by Peterson and Tully uh, on mineralogical record, documenting that it was possible, by a geochemical point of view, studying the isotopes, uh, sorry, studying the isotopes uh, to distinguish this sulfur from the natural one. But if you think when you are very expert people about a locality, you are able from this locality to recognize specimen not only from uh, every discovery, but you are able also to distinguish specimen also from every pocket, and you are able to understand just looking at pieces, oh, this piece belongs to this discovery, belongs to this discovery, and so on. So when you are confident with this kind of material, this is like a single discovery. So when you are an expert of sulfur, and you are able to recognize this particular material because of the matrix, because of the shape of the crystal, because of the color of the crystal, because of the surface of the crystal, because of the tiny corrosions. So at this point, uh, I tell you, it's not such difficult now to recognize fake stuff from natural stuff. 
I tell you one more thing, which is the major point in distinguishing natural stuff from this fake material, is the matrix. The matrix of this specimen was all taken from the Floristella mine. We described the Floristella mine before. It is a celestite mine with massive sulfur or small grains of sulfur. So when you have a Floristella mine matrix and you have nice crystals on top of it, you know this is a fake. Okay, uh, fine. What I want to say in any case is that uh, Uh, yeah, is that uh, when you have uh, a specimen of sulfur, you have uh, an important drop of uh, the recent history of uh, our planet. Remember how the history of sulfur deposits in, Sic in Sicily started and how it evolved. So every great deposit and every great specimen have, is recording some great part of the history of uh, our planet. So I just want to, to let you think uh, how much history of our planet is recorded in a mineral exhibit like the one we saw yesterday at the Arkeston place. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>